black ball. Black, black, black ball. Black, 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 Here's how we roll, folks. Tonight's show is X-rated. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you did. Maybe you don't know what X-rated means. So we're going to vote one fucking time to see how far this show goes. And we're not going backwards, okay? You vote once, okay? You don't fall, you don't fall up the rabbit hole. You go fucking down it. And remember, when you vote, that means you make a shit sandwich. You put bread, you put shit in it, and whatever you vote, you have to eat that shit sandwich. So don't complain to me that your mouth smells like fucking ass. You make the shit sandwich, you eat it. So I can do some cute little dirty jokes, right? Cute little dirty. At the end, we can all sing Kumbaya. <laughs> and feel great about ourselves. Or I can do some fucked up shit. But wait, wait, wait. But you've heard the fucked up shit I've said so far. Let's remember that. And we only vote once. So who wants the nice little cock and suck and fuck jokes? Who wants that? Okay. Four or five Catholics. And who wants the fucked up shit? Come on. All right. It's the late show. Let's remember we voted. Let's remember we voted. Because I guarantee in a minute and a half, you're going to fucking regret this moment. What is up, everybody? My name is James D. Fiore, and this is Black Bald. Uh, sometimes there's certain guests that are just sort of tailor-made for this show um, because one of the main themes behind starting Black Ball Media was to talk about how media likes to blackball us, often from facts, and also from ourselves, <laughs> where, where the media seems to have co-signed this culture of... Uh, See, I don't want to use the word political correctness because that makes people think that I'm like some sort of rabid right winger. But, you know, um, offensive things because it's so subjective, all that kind of stuff. And for certain occupations, especially comedians, this can become, you know, um, a crisis in a way at your occupation. If your occupation is to make people laugh and not necessarily worry about how you got them to laughter. So, um that you just heard his voice he is here right now and he's going to talk to us about what it's like to be a comedian in the era of please don't 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 say anything offensive and his name is darren frost frosty how you doing buddy i am good i'm here yes you are i'm gonna start off ironically mm -hmm. and ask it were you in the movie hairspray <laughs> i was in the movie hairspray yes with john travolta <laughs> i'd scenes with travolta christopher walken and michelle pfeiffer my main scenes were with michelle pfeiffer so what was that like? I, I didn't know that. Sorry. I'd it's, like the it's, it's, yeah. it's, it was a great thing. I mean, you know, I'm just a suck and fuck comic and all of a sudden I'm doing movies now, you know, and, and, um, you know, it was, it was exciting and fun, but you know, it's, it's a lot of waiting. It's not as great as, you know, any actor will laugh whenever you see this, like, um, this kind of like a uh, contest, like win a day on a movie set. It's like, Oh, <sighs> you get to wait around all day and eat cold chicken. Hope yeah. you're ready for that. Cause that's really what the movie business is. You're oh, not sitting there hanging out. Have Extras have to stand there for like ever. Yeah. Like they don't even yeah. get craft services, you know? Yeah. Like, and even hairspray, I got to be a camera guy. So I just had to stand behind a camera, but those people dance for like 12, 14 hours a day, yeah. like over and over and over again. I mean, they were paid well, but it doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. If you're dancing like that for 12 or 14 hours, I mean, that's work. 
Um, yeah, you're, so, you know, you're not you're not even on ecstasy or anything just to like no. help you through. You know, you no, just... like if, if they were doing lines of coke, it'd be like, yes, keep doing that, keep doing yes. that, keep the energy. I'll be going. here till Tuesday if you give me cocaine. Yes. <laughs> um, so okay, I, I don't want to overstate anything, but mm-hmm. you know, because I am not one of those who like yells from the rooftops like everything is Orwellian now, but some shit is. And the one thing that I always thought wouldn't be spared, sort of the um the wrath of whoever the fuck these people are um, about how jokes are offensive. Like I thought comedians would be absolved from having to follow whatever rules came. Um, and then, you know, starting like maybe a decade ago, even you heard people like, I think you know, like Chris Rock saying he wasn't going to do colleges anymore right around that time. Um, right. You know, you had Seinfeld saying, you know, like it's, it's weird that this is happening, but he was, still careful in how he said it was weird so that he wouldn't get canceled. Like it yes. seems like everyone's walking on eggshells. And I just want to know just from a brass tax perspective, as a person who's been doing this, I think you've been doing this for almost three 30. decades. Yeah. It's yeah. 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. Uh, you know, how bad, how bad is the problem? Is it overstated? And has it impacted your bottom line as a person trying to make a living? Okay. So we have to back up. First of all, you have to divide Canada versus the United States. When we start talking about any of this, Yes, cancel culture or whatever you want to call it started about 10 years ago. But really, in our country, Canada, it's always kind of been there. Because when you look at the idea of America right now, all the top comics, more than half of them are dirty comedians. Comedians that you might be deemed as offensive or crossing the line, whatever the term you want to use. But in Canada, if you name all the top comics that most people know, none of them are dirty. And that is because in America, they embrace controversy. In Canada, they've always shied away from it from a media standpoint. Um, not saying the clean comics aren't funny, but for every Brent Butt, there is a Kenny Robinson. And the sad point is, is that no one knows in this country who that is, except a select few people and comics who know that he's a legend because he's been doing it 45 years. And I stand on the shoulders of guys like him. But that's what happened even even 20 years ago. I've noticed that this is the difference. You know, I did Just for Laughs in 2005, and I did, like, the most shows that any Canadian comic had ever done, 21 shows in one year, and it didn't do anything. You know, it, that's just the way it is. So when you look at Canada versus America, it's a big difference. Then you apply this last 10 years, it's even worse now because we as Canadians like to think that we're nice people, that we're friendly people, that we're helping out the underdog. And sometimes we are, and then sometimes it can go too far. And sometimes people are forgetting what intent is. And intent is a very important factor in stand-up comedy. The intent is for laughter, not hurting someone. And there is a byproduct of, of a pain in comedy. And sometimes that pain can be inward, which is where I am now. And sometimes that pain can be outward towards a group of people. And sometimes that group of people doesn't need defending. And sometimes they do. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with basically everything you just said. I, I, I don't, I mean, we're, we're out of the era where people like Andrew Dice Clay can exist you know when i'm not i'm talking about specifically that the and, stuff, and that, the that size yes and that size yeah, that, because dice is still around but he's never going to be playing arenas like that again right and and or at least not with the material that made him famous which was right. really like i I'm, i listen to it now and i'm like I, even if he could get away with it i wouldn't want him to like it's right. pretty bad stuff right like right um but and then, you know, just to, not to cut you off, and here's a problem, right? Because mm. I'm a dirty comic. A lot of times I get lumped into the Sam Kinison, Andrew Dice Clay category. And, you know, with Sam Kinison even, I'm, there's a lot of stuff that Sam did that I was not, I shouldn't call him Sam like we're friends, but a lot of stuff Kinison did I don't even appreciate or like, and even mm-hmm. didn't like when I was 16. Um, there was stuff where it's like, I don't think this is right, and I, I don't find it funny. But that's where it stopped for me. I just yeah, didn't, you didn't do anything call about anyone. It. You didn't call a sponsor. Right. You know? I didn't try to do anything about it. I just didn't buy a ticket to a show. And yeah. that's the whole thing that's gone on now. It's like, you know what? It's like the Louis C.K. thing that happened a couple of years ago. He comes back to Toronto. There was a big, big issue about it in, in Toronto. A lot of people put their two cents in. Me personally, my attitude about it is I don't think Louis C.K. did enough to, to come back. That's my personal opinion. I think he could have done more. He could have done, you know, um, uh, whether it's an interview or a certain amount of money going to certain causes, I think he could have done more, but that's my personal opinion. So I, that's what I think. I did not buy a ticket. I didn't go and support it, but lots of my best friends went and said it was a great show. And I'm not sitting there going, well, you're not my friend anymore. I'm just like, <laughs> I think he didn't do enough. You thought he did enough. Nobody knows where that line is, but every individual sets that line up. And that's think, the problem where we are. Do you think that that line is even something that we should even consider? Because, because 
when you were when you were saying maybe you didn't do enough, I was understanding. I was trying to understand you, but and, and I think even though I think I understood what you meant, I, I, mm -hmm. it feels like that's a public relations decision more so than an actual decision of like some sort of sincerity. Because a lot of us who aren't in the business um, saw what happened and was like. I was, and I know a lot mm -hmm. of people that have felt this way. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was refreshing. His uh, statement said the word dick twice, and he obviously didn't get help from a PR agency, which makes all the authenticity right. and sincerity seem to melt away. Right. You know, and he lost probably $20 million because of that movie that got shelved of course, or whatever. Of course, yeah. And and so uh, that's probably payment enough. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it just, it didn't feel... He still, he still never came out. Like, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about. Like, the idea that his agent at the time, the women that did come forward, they, they did lose work because of it. They were Their careers were stunted because of it. And he never really commented on that part. He admitted to doing what he did, and that's where it stopped. So this hmm. is where I'm saying, like, not every individual needs to know all that information. I know certain things, and for me, I didn't think he did enough. But, you know, a, a person has to make a living. And as long as I also think that he handled certain things around it correctly and didn't do the PR thing and just, you know, mm -hmm. prayers and hugs, you know, kind of thing when a school shooting happens. Do you think um, it's hard for him to masturbate now just because it reminds him? Of no, I don't pain? think it does at all. I yeah. think if he's a narcissist, he probably becomes harder now. Wow. Imagine that. Yeah. Because everyone's looking at him. Oh, I have yeah. to take advantage of this. <laughs> if he wants to watch before, now everybody's like, oh, I wonder what he's doing. He's probably thinking about whacking off right now. I love Louis C.K. I, I know that a lot That's of this like, stuff. For, for, yeah. for, look, for 10 years on I every don't... radio show I ever did, they'd ask yeah. me who the favorite, com the most funniest comic you've ever seen is. It was Louis C.K. That was even before mm -hmm. Louis became a star. This is when Louis would come to Toronto and play the Laugh Resort and just play to like, you know, 80 people on a bus tour. He and, had great and hair back then. His oh, hair yeah, was awesome back hair. then. You had good hair back then too. You, you oh, yeah, back then. Yeah, sure. Look at that, that fella with the yeah. gazoo shirt. Like you, yeah, you're like the first oh, hipster. Man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then you and then you started to lose it a little bit, right? Yeah, of course. Yep. yep. Don't worry. This I'm only going. I'm allowed to do this. This is like sure. The end. The N word rule is in effect. You know how like you yep. can only say it if. Well, this, I'm only allowed to make fun of you because I have no hair. And then right. we obviously see that the happiness train um, stops here. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's when I stop smiling all photos. I do not smile on any photo for promotional purposes. But Even you, after you, shows, you'll never see it. You'll learn, you, but you did learn that it's like you only really look bald if you don't shave the size of your head. Right? Like yes, other than yes. that, you could you could tell people you're an ex biker when you start shaving shaving the sides. Like know? in the acting world, if you look like George Costanza with hair on the side, you book roles. If you shave it all off, you don't book unless you're some some kind of alien role or Star Trek, because then they can put all the stuff on you. And clearly, sir, you were not in the pool. Just no. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, okay. D is it true that you once tried to chase Wayne Gretzky while driving a Dickie D bike? Yes, that is that is true. Yes. Can, can you and, talk uh, about 19, that? A bit? We're going to go back and forth from political yeah. incorrectness to this. Sure. You know? Yeah. So I grew up in Brantford, Ontario, uh, and that's obviously where Wayne Gretzky's from. And when I was 13, I w had a job as a Dickie D ice cream boy, the bikes with the bells and all that, and selling the kids the drugs. Who wants hash? Ding, ding, ding. And uh, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky was in town training for the summer, and I was by his house, and I saw him pop his head out, looks both ways, and goes for a jog. And I'm like, look, man, I got it. This is Wayne Gretzky. I got to get him to sign something. So I chased him on the ice cream bike, and I yelled at him, Wayne, will you sign my spacicle, please? And he probably thought I was a pervert, and he kept on running. And he went up a curb, and I tried to go up a curb, but these things are top heavy. And I smashed, and I fell off the bike, and... You know, Wayne Gretzky turned and just laughed at me and ran off. <laughs> he laughed at you? Yeah, laughed at me and took off. How old? Were you like 12 or something? How old were you? 13. I was 13. And so he was like 19, 20? No, he was, he was got to be in his early 20s. Oh, okay. This is when he was with Edmonton. He was already established. Mm. Um. Now, do you think you were right in chasing him? <laughs> Sure, I was in right, and even the I'm way not I tell I'm that not story, talking about. I'm not talking about because you don't want to bug the celebrity. I'm talking right. about the fact that you had a bunch of drugs in your dicky D. <laughs> sure. You're, what are the cops going to do? I'm 13. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> where, 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 where are things things cops, go? Cops probably overlook. It was probably the most hilarious thing for cops because they're sitting in their squad car waiting for speeders, and then a dicky D rolls on, and they're sure. like, "Should we? Should we bust this one?" Nah. Yeah. Nah, fuck it. Yeah. It was a great, a great business. Sell them drugs and ice cream afterwards. Come on. It's a one-stop shop. How old were you the first time you ever performed on stage? And how did that performance go? And do you remember uh, any of the bits? Because I was like, uh, yeah, something. of course. Yeah, I performed at my university when I went to Brock University. I was uh, 18 years old. 
And I did a whole bunch of jokes about TV shows and kid shows we all grew up on, like Polka Dot Door and Romper Room and uh, Davy and Goliath, all that stuff. And, you know, it did very, very well. And then I did another talent show. And then as soon as I graduated from university, I made a deal with my parents that if I went to school and got a business degree, then after that I could perform comedy and that's what I was going to do. And, and the next day I pretty much got on stage at a Yuck Yuck Amateur Night and the rest is history. 30 years of regret. <laughs> yeah. It's all inward now, as you said. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, I want, I, I'm always like curious. I, I, I told, uh, Simon Rakoff this as well when I had him on, unfortunately I had accidentally eaten 50 milligrams of, of weed. So it was a weird interview, but sure. um, the, the one thing that I do like to ask comics is, um, like their ecosystem is weird. Cause it's like, they're kind of alike, but they're also different from one another. And a lot of th things that I'm fascinated with is the process of a comic and how long it takes them to get material done and what right. their process is. Can right. you give me a little hint on yours? Cause I, I find the answer is always different and I find it interesting. Yeah. I mean, so for me, uh, I, uh, so a lot of people always call it the Louis CK model, like coming up with a new hour every two years. And I used to call that the George Carlin model, but people forget. Yeah. Um, so for me, what I would do is I would come out, like I have, uh, I'm doing a recording in July 8th. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but that will be my eighth official ninth. If I count a bootleg release that I've put out. Um, and that's a lot of material for a comedian in Canada. I think only Ron James through his CBC uh, shows and specials has more. So independently, I'm the, I'm the top. Um, so I'm always working, um, you know, writing jokes, writing them down, getting on stage, doing open mics, getting them to the level of then maybe getting them onto a Saturday night show and then putting them into the show. So if you come and see me like two, three years apart, you may only see two or three minutes of 45 minutes to an hour. That's the same. And that's generally the opening joke because it sets the tone, which is a great thing. Your opening joke as a comic is your hardest thing because it's got to set your character and it's got to set up the crowd and know this is different than everyone else. So I have one of those and that's mm -hmm. kind of like my repetitive thing. And then it's like whatever I feel like doing. And, you know, love me or hate me, you're never going to forget me. So I don't care if I kill or bomb. Both will be done with style and both will be done with like, if you see me five years from now, I'm like, that's the guy who killed or that's the guy that made it really awkward. Yeah, but I love it. I love gallows humor. I love awkward like envelope pushing stuff. Um, And I watched a couple hours or something of your stuff over the last sure. three days. You know, I just yeah. wanted to like get to know you, uh, you know, as a performer and I mean, yeah, there's stuff in there that's pretty biting, but like, I, I, I was, I was kind of dumbfounded because I was like, I couldn't find anything that I've, I haven't seen Anthony Jeselnik. Like, I'm not saying the jokes are the Amen. same, but like, Amen. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then, and you know, and Netflix, like you said, promotes all of them. Like Bill Burr yes. says things that are biting. Yes. So I, I guess the question is sort of twofold. What, what is it with um, the Canadian comic industry i don't know what you would call it is it a nightclub driven sort of like unspoken policy to make sure canadian comics don't have you know the ability to like play big places like massey hall comes to mind right you know in places like that where they literally have like a a quorum <laughs> of yeah. people not qualified to yeah to decipher what a good joke is deciphering what good jokes are I don't it's know what just, to do, it's, but, just, like, it's, it's a business is never going to change unless it gets burnt down and then rebrought again. That's my personal opinion. I mean, I, I'm like I said, I'm 30 years in and nothing has really changed in, in certain ways. It's a, a bit of a gatekeepers type system. And once that person moves on, hopefully someone new comes along and kind of changes it. But I've been around four generations now of the industry and it hasn't really changed much. You know, Canada can only have four or five celebrities at a time. And yeah. that's the reality of it. And, uh, you know, if someone is uh, a hardworking comic and they're clean and they're a hardworking comic and they're dirty, where's the light going to shine? They're going to shine on the one that can go on the morning show and make all the women laugh on the panel, right? Not mm -hmm. the one who's going to look like a creepy troll and say awkward things. Some women really like creepy trolls. I don't of course they do. And they're the sure. ones that are like me, broken children. And well, you know, that's, it's all good. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, this, 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 it's never going to, in my opinion, it's never going to change. So I have to either accept that I have to do everything myself, which is what I do now with rank and vile. I book ever. I'm the tour manager. I find the dates. I find the hotels, the, the flights. I do everything myself. So if we yeah. make money, it's on my back. No one else can blame it and no one else can take away my accomplishments. And I'm proud of my accomplishments and people think it's me bragging. It's not bragging. Try sticking it out in 30 years in this business when they keep telling you you're not funny or you're not as funny as this person and you know you are. 
Do you remember the last time you got in a little bit of hot water and what the joke was? Because I'm just curious what has gotten you sort of in trouble before or what has made a producer be like, look, we really like your voice work. Um, okay, so the last time I got in trouble... But if someone finds out that Cubby once said this about yes. periods, then... Yes. You know. So the last time I got into trouble... So I have two eras of my career. I hate to sound so much like an egomaniac, but before I used to talk a lot about news things. And when you talk about the news, everyone has an opinion about it. That's when I got into most of my trouble. That's where the death threats happen, being attacked, all that type of stuff. Because people get drunk and then they lose the word fight. And then it has to escalate from there. Once I started pointing the gun more inward and more towards my own life and my kids and my own experiences, people didn't get that upset, even though it's shockingly things I'm saying. Because for whatever reason, you know, my last big problem was the bus beheading. That was the real controversial thing for me. And that's what, 15, 12, 15 years ago? Um, yeah. That six newspapers. Plus, that was really Canada. funny. It was a great, it's a great bit. And I still behind that. Oh, I don't know about the bit. bit, but the, I mean, someone got their head cut off in a Greyhound. That's, you know, the, my, I'm not, the, the bit is a great bit. It gets an applause break. That's yeah. why I can say it's a great bit. But you know what happened? The uh, family members saw the bit, didn't like it. A lawyer contacted uh, some press. The press contacted me. And my attitude is, what am I going to do here? This isn't a special interest group that says we shouldn't be making fun of this. Mm -hmm. This is the family of the victim. That's like the only person that could call you about that joke. And they exactly. did. Exactly. Yeah. So I had to make a decision. Am I an artist or am I a human first? So you know what I did? I took the clip down. I took it down for two or three years. And then I put it back up again. Because I figure, you know what, after two or three years, I'm hoping that there's enough time that they watch the clip and know I'm not making fun of the victim. I'm making fun of the media. Because that's what the bit was about, how the media reacted to the bus beheading. You would have thought it was our September 11th, the way the media went nuts about it. Yeah, it was like these, um, what does uh, Ricky Gervais always say? Something like that, that audiences often mistake the subject of the dope uh, of the joke for the, yes. for the target. Yes. If you make fun of cancer... Even though there's something funny in cancer, and I know a lot of people said there's nothing funny. Well, guess what? I have cancer. I can say whatever I want, but I'll tell you what. I used to make jokes about cancer, and I stopped making them the second I had cancer because I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm like, I can do it because I have cancer. Either you're in or you're out. That's my show. That's what I've always said. I've always branded it that way. You're always going to hear jokes that you may not like or appreciate, but the next one you will. And that's all I can do. I can't it's tell what someone's going to like and not like. That's up to them. Is it too difficult? And I'm asking, honestly, I'm not, I'm not trying to be an asshole here, but like, is it right. too difficult to find the humor in something that's happening so close to you? Like, is that, is it? No, I mean, is... all pain, all comedy is tragedy plus time. Mm -hmm. That's an old saying. It's tragedy plus time. It's just for some people, the time has to be longer. For me, it's, you know, the next day, you know, the week after my mother died, I said it on stage and then I said, I'm so over it. And people were like, oh. I'm like, hey, it's my mother. I can say whatever the fuck I want. You know, I don't have to listen to her drone on and on every night. Yeah, like, there's, yeah. Uh, do I care about my mother? Of course. Am I sad she died? Of course. But this is how I'm going to process it. And, you know, that's up to me. That's not up to you. It's my mother. I can say whatever I want. There's a part of me that feels like Dave Chappelle is like the glitch in the Matrix that could help save comedy. And the reason why is because I have never seen white liberals like far left like I am sh shake literally shaking because I saw Ann Coulter walk by like those people. Right. I've never seen them attack a black man. <laughs> right. Like, going against their own rules. Right. Like because I guess they subscribe to the hierarchy that says that trans are now more oppressed than black people. I guess I don't know where you, where they get who, who judges that contest. But right. Um, it is. But, and, and I think that eventually that juxtaposition is going to be not lost on people. And they're going to be like, well, maybe you're just full of shit. Pink, pink hair people like maybe I think event time, not... time is a great equalizer that's what I always say and that's the thing about being around as long as I have or being around guys like Kenny who's been around 45 years in five years let's come back and see what everybody thinks because there's going to be a, a situation where people are going to be they canceled someone and then five years later they're going to regret what they did they're going to realize that maybe they shouldn't have they were in the heated moment whatever uh, and they're going to regret what they did Everything is so fast right now. Social media, although it's helped comedy in some ways to be able to get the word out, it's also hindered comedy because now there's no working on a bit anymore. You know, sometimes I've mm. said horrible things on stage, but I'm working it out. And then someone films that and puts it out there. My career is over. That's a reality. That's going to happen. 
Has it ever happened and someone didn't know and then nothing happened to their career? <laughs> like, I'm just wondering, like, with, if the exposure is I'm there. sure it has. I'm sure it yeah. has that people. But now comics have to worry about it where we never had to before. Yeah, because you, before difference. you guys were worried about like whether the bar is going to kind pay of a large you. contingent of other comics. Like, like I hear a lot of conversations about comics who are talking about other comics who steal jokes. Yes. And because you can't copyright a joke, it becomes a real cutthroat vicious yes. kind of thing where people yes. like like um the the asshole song from uh, wasn't that a yeah, louis dennis leary oh, yeah. dennis leary yeah so that louis ck uh has gone on the record and said that that was his uh his song or his idea yes yeah so it, it dennis must be leary's really also been accused of dennis leary's also been accused of stealing from bill hicks and if anybody knows the comedy history uh, at all of comics bill hicks is seen as probably one of the most iconic comedians of all time i mean he's not Robin as big Williams. as prior well, yeah, Rob Williams. Rob Williams uh, stole jokes. He admitted that on um, Mark Maron's podcast. I wonder if it was just because he was so twitchy and like scatterbrain that it came into his head. He performed it because he was like, he was just reaching for something and that's what he grabbed. And then afterwards was like, because I heard he cut people checks afterwards. Well, I mean, that was so Rolling Stone in the late 80s or mid 80s did a comedy issue and it's pretty famous. And that's what he said. But he once it hit Rolling Stone, he had to stop doing that because every comic would call his manager and just say, hey, you did my joke. And like probably didn't. But he just now they know he's writing checks. So that did happen for a while. And, you know, yeah. there used to be a way where comics just took care of themselves. So if you stole a joke, you'd get the shit kicked out of you after the show. Like that's nice. how they handled it. Um I'm not a believer in physical violence because I've been attacked, but I understand that it gets to that if you're not going to stop stealing from me and there's not much I can do. Um, so that's, it's weird that, that actually it's, happened. That, it's weird that Robin Williams is one of them because um, to be honest with you, he's the kind of comic where I don't necessarily remember his jokes and punchlines. I remember his physicality. Yes, you know? because Rob Williams had, he was more of a performer than a writer. And mm. most comics are one or the other. So you look at someone like, uh, you know, Emo Phillips, writer, and st definitely different performer, mm. but stronger writer. Stephen Wright, 100% writing, nothing in the delivery. You know, and then you have comics that are like the Sebastian. I, I always fuck up his last name. Um, you know, he plays arenas. I'm sure mm. he would say he's much more of a performer than a writer. You know, and that's just the way it is. It's, it's yeah. always one more than the other. Yeah, he was good in The Irishman, that 17-hour movie that... I yes. sometimes watch pieces of. Yes. <laughs> I, I've never sat down and watched the beginning. Yeah, you then. piece it together like a Zabruder film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did does does that sort of culture in Canadian comedy where they're a little bit more tight ass, mm -hmm. is that kind of like a, a prompting force to get you to try to like branch out into more voice work? Or is it like just different balls that you're juggling and one has nothing to do with the other? Yeah, nothing. One has nothing to do with the other. Uh, you have to wear many hats in this business. I've always said it's like everyone thinks that, you know, even the top comics in this country, they have a side hustle. Every comedian mm -hmm. you tell me or name, none of them only makes their money from stand up comedy. There is just not the economics in this country other than Ron James right now. Ron James is the only one. Everyone else, for the most part, is either writing on a show or acting on a show or doing a voice on a show. Mm -hmm. And that's what they supplemented because there just isn't enough money in this country to keep someone going. Even someone like Jerry D, he's got the TV show, shows, and he does the touring. So it all adds together into a pot. And the same thing for me. I have my XM money because I have my stuff that's played on XM. I have my live date money. I have my cartoon money. And that all gets together so I can not kill myself and bury. Yeah. Especially with that big sculpture at the edge of the lake. Like, yeah. That's just dying for a rope. You just want to climb on top of it and jump off. <laughs> that's right. I can um, see you in this, Phil. Are, are, are you optimistic? About how it's going to, you just said, in waiting to see what happens in five years. What do you think is going to happen in five years? I, I, I think that um, you're going to see that the comedy club system is just not going to be around, I think. I think it's it's already dying. It's a dying thing. And it's just going to be more pop-up shows and more people doing their own shows and tours. Mm -hmm. And it's just trying to find your own audience through whatever you're doing, whether it's podcasting or TikTok. I mean, TikTok is all the rage right now. Uh, I don't have the tits for it. So I'm hoping for the next thing sure? is going to be all about, you know, <laughs> troll cock. And if it's about yeah. troll cock, I'm going to make a million dollars. <laughs> troll cock. Yeah. Can you explain troll cock, please? Troll cock. Yeah, I'm gonna dance under a bridge, show my cock in short little videos, and uh, it'll knock TikTok off the off the internet. That is like a what is that, a, 
a, a, a Canadian moment in history? Yes. <laughs> just like I have underneath. many of them. <laughs> With like a Nirvana song playing in the background. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Um, All apologies. That will be the song. That's right. But no, but you don't apologize, right? That's the whole point, no. right? Isn't it? Like no. you apologize to the, that's crazy that the person's family contacted you in that beheading Greyhound joke. Because well, no, no, they, did, that, they never contacted me. They contacted a lawyer and a lawyer contacted the press right. and the press contacted me for my uh, statement about it because they were going to run articles and they did. They ran six across the country calling me evil and all this. Like that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> It was just yeah. a joke. But do you think like, and I don't mean this as a diss on you or anything, but like maybe if the spotlight is bigger, like I always thought that it wasn't really the joke. It was how people delivered the joke. Right. That's why Louis C.K. was the be. only white comic that could use the N word in his, in his set. I mean, it can be, I mean, uh, I don't think Louis C.K. would open with that joke uh, at the beginning of his set. He would get people on their side and then all of a sudden slip that in. But uh, mm. yeah, it's, it's definitely how you tell a joke. Intent is important, but it's also delivery. And I bet you it killed live. Which one? The joke about um, about the Greyhound. Yes, yeah, like it, it gets applause breaks. I'll, I'll, if I can find the clip, I'll send it to you. It's 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 literally not as bad as you think it is. It makes fun of the media more than anything else. But this is the thing. Like I have a joke on my new last special about the nine eleven memorial. Some people don't yeah. like that joke because you can't can make fun it? of nine eleven. You can say anything you want on my podcast if you. Well, you the joke, the basic joke is that, that you, if you go to the museum at the nine eleven site, at the end of the museum, there's a gift shop, and I said I don't want to think that the world has gone crazy with marketing, but should we be really celebrating nine eleven? Yay, you know nine <laughs> eleven, woo! And you know they have everything. They have toys for children in there, which they did. I'm like they should have the twin towers by Jenga, you know. Oh. And, Wow, yeah, that's yeah, nice. Yeah, no, no, yeah. When I say oh, Bill Maher yeah. already think always thinks that when the, his audience goes oh, that they're booing. They're no, not. they're, they're just, just having a thought. They're just figuring yeah. it out. Like oh man, that's harsh. Yes, that is very you know, they well done in the gallows. I like it. They should they should sell t shirts too. You know, my uncle worked in Tower Seven, and all I got was a shitty t shirt and a dead fucking uncle on the back. Yes, thanks a lot, Silver. I mean, th these are all harsh jokes, but none of them really are that bad it's making fun of the marketing it's making fun of the there's a gift yeah. shop that's creepy at the end of a museum like this you know it totally is and there's like you know i, I remember th having the thought and this is probably would be one of those jokes that you wouldn't tell about 9 11 this is not even a joke that i had but i always wondered like because the footage of planes mm -hmm. going into the building mm -hmm. that means that there's like a like a few hundred people out there that every time they see that plane going into the building they're watching their sister die or they're watching oh their yeah dad die. oh yeah and i used to wonder whether or not people experience that kind of trauma from that. And so as we're talking now, I'm thinking, okay, that might be a shitty joke about 9-11 because, you know, you're making fun of someone's trauma and yes. how they react to seeing a plane yes. crash. You could also yes. make that about the media because they constantly show the thing. Yes. You know, but uh, an amateur like me that did, doesn't know the fine art of delivering a joke on a stage, um, yeah. you know, would be afraid to tell that joke. Uh, the, the easy way to do that joke is you bring up that idea and then imagine every 9-11 that family member can't watch television because every time they turn it on they're like they're watching their favorite episode of golden girls we interrupt this we want to show you this plane you know, henry there's, there's he's things. finally reading a book yeah <laughs> you know so there, there's ways of doing that joke where you're not really making fun of them you're making fun of the fact it's pushed in their face all the time and they have their own trauma that they relive over and over and over again so right. once, once again it's all what you do with the joke no joke, no joke is off limits, but that doesn't mean every joke should be told. I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I ask everyone this too, since, since it's happened, because I just, I, I don't want to talk about it like it's a pop culture subject. I just want to talk about right. it from a comedian standpoint, because mm -hmm. you now have something in common with, or Chris Rock now has something in common with you. Right. Which is getting smacked on stage. Yes. I, I thought personally, and I know it was the Oscars, so he kind of had to. The reason why some people thought it was fixed is because how fucking much he stood his ground when, when that like when, when someone twice his size smacked him. He like went back, realized it wasn't a joke, tried to like set himself back up. How hard is it to gather your composure? Because you know what it's like to be attacked on stage it, after something like that happens. It's not easy. Um, there's a very famous clip of Jim Jeffries getting um, attacked on stage. And after he got attacked, he pretty much just stopped the show and walked off stage. You know, if I was Jim yeah. Jeffries, I could do that. I'm not, you know, I'm a complete unknown. So I had to do 15 more minutes after being attacked that night on that video. I still had to close the show. I still had to say goodnight to all those fucking people. 
You know, I still did what I had to do. Did I got you, a job what, to do, man. Show goes on. Yeah, okay. So you wanted to do it. It wasn't like you were forced to do it. Like they weren't. No, like I wasn't like forced, this. but I'm, I'm still like, you know what? Like, don't get me wrong. I love awkward and it's my superpower, mm. but it's under my terms. I would never want a show that someone paid to to end just on that. And I'm not sure if it's in the video. I don't think it is, but I literally say to them, I'm going to do extra time tonight because of what just fucking happened. And all that took that time that took away from me. I'm going to keep doing more material and make sure you guys enjoy what's going on because I don't want your last yeah. thought of the show of me getting hit. I want your last thought going, that guy was fucking funny and some cunt hit him. That's what I want them to remember. Yeah. And, and as you should be able to remember that, cause it's like, you know, I think it was Seinfeld bit in one of the shows where he's like, I don't go to your work and heckle you, you know, like yeah. it's, it seems like it's one of those things where the establishment and we talked about this a bit off air about how the establishment never seems all that willing or could have been at the beginning of the interview, uh, all that willing to, to take matters into their hands and yeah, no security, hecklers. no security, no, like, so in New York city, just so you, just so you understand difference between New York and Toronto or Vancouver in New York, it's gotten so bad that they take your cell phone away from you. You have to put it mm -hmm. in a special bag and yeah, you it's like not going to Drake's your, house. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And you do not get your cell phone back until after the show. Wow. And yeah. I think everywhere should do that for yeah. live entertainment. Because, oh, but my kids, if you're fucking worried about your kids, don't come to the show. I'm the father mm -hmm. to three kids. I have gone to many shows. There's never been once when I've been in the audience and I'm sitting in the front row. If I'm worried about my kids, I'm sitting in the back and I'll walk outside and check my phone. Mm -hmm. This isn't yeah. rocket science. This is called respect. This is respecting the audience that came out to see a show. You're not the only person. And that has always been my problem in comedy. It's one douchebag who thinks that they run things and they're the mouthpiece for the whole audience. Yeah, I, and it's uh, it's it's too bad too because like, there's a culture there. Like, like comedians have a culture, and I don't really yes. know who I can say that about in show business. You know, I don't, I don't think game show hosts all hang out. You know, I don't think. look, comics are a tribe. Even comics, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Even comics that don't like each other, and there's many I don't like. But if I'm on a show with one of them, and an audience member fucks with them, I don't care what my relationship is with that comic. It's now me and that comic against that asshole, no matter yeah. what. So if, if, if I even despise this comedian with every ounce of my body, if someone jumps on that fucking stage, I'm on that stage and I'm doing something about it. I'm not waiting for security. I'm doing something about it. And I would like to think that even the other person who doesn't like me would have that same code. There is a code amongst comics and you know, we don't have to like each other. And sometimes we have to be in car rides together or be forced to be on the same shows together, but there is a code and that is part of that code. We don't steal That's jokes. That's what I love about it. And That's we have we, it. each other's backs when mm -hmm. push comes to shove. Yeah. That's great. Like, uh, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what I like about it. It's so funny that, uh, um, it, it, I, it's not like, I hate that I have to disclaim this now, but we live in that world. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I used to watch Joe Rogan's podcast a lot because he had a right. lot of comics on it and I love listening to comics, talk to each other. Um, so I learned a lot about like, backstories and stuff from guests that he's had on that show mm -hmm. um the interesting thing is i don't think joe rogan's a very good comic <laughs> like, i just don't like he screams a lot right like it doesn't seem like he doesn't I, he's very popular but it feels like like his career is interesting because it's like i like him as a podcaster uh, right used, used to like him a little bit more but i like right. him right. um and the ufc announcer he's good and then a comic eh, he's okay. so here, here's my opinion on joe rogan yeah i think in the beginning joe rogan was an okay comic and he got some success because he was in L.A. with Fear Factor and News Radio. And mm -hmm. what happens when you're doing those shows? You have no time to work on your act. Mm -hmm. You have no time. But you still got to feed that monkey. You still have an agent. Who's, we got to put a special out and take advantage of this Fear Factor thing. So yeah. he puts a special out that he probably now would go, it wasn't my strongest stuff. Well, mm -hmm. what happened with Joe Rogan is those shows went away. And then he went on the road. And there's one special or two specials in the middle of that where he only concentrated on comedy that I find are very, very good specials. Oh. Then Maybe what happened is, is podcast took off. And when you're talking for three hours a day and the research yeah. and all that shit, how much time are you really working on your act? So I've not seen a, a, a new special of Joe. I wouldn't be surprised if the quality isn't that high, but um, those two in the middle there, I, I think if you watch those, you'd be like, okay, this is a guy who's actually got something to say and he's not just screaming. Yeah. You know, boxers, uh, the good boxers study tapes and they have like yes. tapes of yes. boxing from like the forties to, you know, the present era. 
Right. Are, are some com are you like that? You know, are you not a comedy encyclopedia, but do you like watch consume a lot of comedy? I don't watch pretty much any stand up comedy unless I'm going to be asked about it. Hmm. And even that, like the Dave Chappelle special, I never watch because I don't want to go on the record and say anything about it. Like I'll <laughs> defend his right to say whatever he wants to say, but yeah. it got into such a pissing match on Facebook and on social media. I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. I don't want anything to do with it. But if it's someone like I like to watch young comics, that's my hmm. thing. I love to see someone who's like maybe not connecting with a crowd, but I know they're funny. And I'll, I'll, every time I'll go up to that comic and I'll be like, you have something. I don't care what this fucking crowd thinks, but this, that, that's the thing that gets me like my kind of juices flowing and back into comedy again. You know, am I going to watch the new Norm McDonald special? No. Um, I watched a couple mm -hmm. minutes of it. It was, it was, it was you know, nice and everything, but that's not my thing. Um, I appreciate sure that. Young, yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say the young com comedians probably appreciate a veteran. 100%. Even if it is troll cock, you know, coming up to yes. you and telling you that yeah. you did a really good job, you know? Yeah, like, I remember there's a comic who lives in England right now. He's hysterical. His name is Bobby Mayer, and everyone should look him up. First time I ever saw him, he bombed in Toronto, bombed. And me and another comic were in the back, and we were howling. It was hilarious stuff he was throwing, but he was awkward, and this was a little bit of a nicer venue, and he was not mm. the nicer kind of looking comic. And I took him upside, and I said, look, man, I don't care what the, these, you're funny. You're coming on the road with me. Like, oh, wow. and I got him some gigs and, you know, he got you know, more shows under his belt and now he's like funnier than I am. And I'm glad about that. You know, he's bigger than I am. Great. Cause I want to reward people that work hard. There's something to be said about people that work hard that is lost in the social media world. And I don't mean hard, uh, TikTok video every day. I mean, out there writing new material and getting mm -hmm. it out there. That's why I got into this. That's why I love George Carlin and Richard Pryor because of their bulk of the work that they put out. That impresses me. So when I see young comics hustling and not just hustling the, the marketing of it, but on stage, that impresses me. Yeah. And, and it, it impresses me too. Like I, again, I, I have such a reverence for your industry. I, I just do. It's just such a standalone, you know, facet of show business. It's and a very uh, weird offshoot of show business. You know, yeah. it's, I told, like, uh, who was it? I think it was Simon Rakov. And I told Bullard this too, that, um, it, it's like in, in hockey, there's the goaltender in baseball. There's the knuckleball pitcher, right? You know, and they're always like oddballs. Yeah. And in show business, that's the comedians, right? Like comedians are broken children. They've all had some like, and some comics not. And there's a couple comics who don't like this kind of theory, but most comics are broken children. Something fucked up happened to them or they didn't, they weren't popular in high school. Like we're talking 70%, 70% of all comics. Thank God for uncles with boundary issues or we would never right. have such a, such great field of comedians. Right. And that, and that, and that's a true thing. And I, and I'm a broken child. I admit it, you know, uh, shit, fucked up shit happened to me, but you know what? I make my rent on that. Now I've got stories that people go, this can't be true. And I'm like, yeah, it's true. That's the ultimate success story. I, this I'm a late to the party guy when it comes to that. But what you just said completely crystallizes like exactly what my overall arching idea is in life now is that failures are not just lessons that you learn from there within it. There is a silver lining that can be fucking amazing because it's made up of the same amount of energy. And if you just direct it into something else, you can, yeah, you I mean, can even, make the even, most out of a failure. Even the story about Gretzky. So let's just back up for a second. Just so you mm -hmm. understand the way I tell that story. I say that he turned and looked at me and laughed. Okay. But in reality, I'm not even hundred percent sure if he turned and looked at me and laughed. I just saw him laughing run away. Imagine it wasn't might, Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> but no, it was, but he may have not even seen me crash. He may have still just been laughing at the fact he's being chased by a kid in an ice cream bike. That would be funny, right? Maybe he bought I, something. No from you way. Earlier on. Wayne Gretzky saw me crash and <laughs> yeah. wouldn't come help me. Come on. It's Wayne. It's Wayne fucking Gretzky. You know, the guy's got a heart of gold. He would never not do something if someone got hurt. Like, it's ridiculous. But I'm not going to lie. On stage as a troll and angry guy, I'm going to twist the truth just a little. But that story yeah. is fact. That actually happened. And let me tell you something. If I got to do a clean show, I put that story in, people go nuts. People still come up to me this day and bring up that story. So the amount of money I've probably made from that story, trust me, I will chase anyone on an ice cream bike now. I have a true Wayne Gretzky story. Okay. Do you want to hear my true Wayne sure, Gretzky story? Yeah. Okay, I'll be quick because not I'm not interviewing myself here. But um, right. I went to New York, snuck into Madison. I'm giving you the Coles notes. Snuck okay. into Madison Square Garden with my buddy. It was like 11 a.m. on a weekday. 
was right. during the Rangers and and the Knicks were playing like and it, w- it was ice at that point because there was a Ranger game that night. Sure. And we walked around the innards of MSG and no one seemed to care. <laughs> and then we walked towards the ice. We were in the Zamboni lane and then we walked towards the center ice where the uh, another little lane is. And uh, and we we had we were surprised that they sold beer in New York City at 10 a.m. So we had a couple beers yeah, before we course. went there. Yeah. And course. then we got caught by security who pointed us from the other side of the arena. So I went like this to the boards. And we ran out. And then we were at the Allstate Cafe hours later watching the Rangers play someone. And Ulf Samuelson body checked somebody else into the boards and the glass fell and knocked out Gretzky's wife. And we and the announcer was amazed at how quickly the uh, the stretcher got there because she was seated in the seats right beside that center ice lane. Right. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there at the Allstate Cafe and I'm looking at my buddy. And I'm just like, do you think? And he's like, we did that? I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it looks like the same glass, you know. So So I I, I lived in Brantford, Ontario, and when I was 18, I was an usher in a movie theater. And Mm -hmm. this is when Batman, the first Batman, the Tim Burton Batman came out. And Wayne Gretzky literally took the first three rows of um, the theater and he brought all these kids in with special needs. Wayne and Janet did no. And, you know, a couple, um, I don't don't know, uh, assistants or whatever, but they came in. They came in. They made sure all the kids were happy. They took care of them. They, you know, it's fucking Wayne Gretzky, you know, and Janet mm. Gretzky. There, there, there wasn't like just a photo op, and then they left. You know what I mean? So it's like I uh, sometimes I, I try not to be careful how I tell that story because I don't want to portray him too badly. But you know, fuck it, I'm a troll. Yeah, <laughs> I just like I like hearing celebrities do nice things, like especially yeah. when they don't have to. You know? Yeah. Even on when- Hairspray, John Travolta, he did all this. Like a lot of you know, John Travolta gets a lot of flack and a lot of you know. The back talk or whatever, but I'll tell you something, man. On Hairspray, there was a day that all these kids came and he spent time with them and he made sure they were all happy. They were special needs kids, and he he got he paid for this fucking uh, French fry truck for the whole crew, the whole thing, like it's a specialty thing, and he took care of everyone. I mean, I didn't get to talk to him that much because he had a fat suit on and he wasn't the super <laughs> nice guy to me. But yeah. you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm just some you know camera guy number three to him. But uh, yeah. He, you Plus, know. he was going to get audited as soon as he left the set by the Scientologists. Yes. yes. You know, that would have been weird. He's going to have to show on the E.T. doll where he was touched. Yeah, that's right. And he'll just point to his wallet over and yes. over again. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's coming up for you? And uh, and it, it, you said it's your ninth comedy album. And you told me on the phone, I think we were on the phone, that uh, that that it might be a record. Is that right? So it's definitely the most independent releases. So I released Mm -hmm. a a CD, then four DVDs, then a bootleg CD, then two other CDs, and now another one. We call it CDs, but it really is just for, you know, for uh, social media and for all the the playlists and all that. But uh, yeah, we're recording an album July 8th in downtown Toronto at the Rec Room. Uh, Myself and Kenny Robinson is a show called Rank and Vile. It is Canada's raunchiest comedy tour. You're going to see two headlining comics in one night. Tickets are only 20 bucks, and we're recording it, and you can be part of history. It's at the rec room down by Sky Dome. Dude, that's dope. I like that. I, I like how in an era where you're not supposed to do what you're doing, that you're doing it, and uh, and that you should be, and there's nothing wrong with doing it, and I admire If you don't that. do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. Well, I admire that's, that. That's I, I think that. that I wish a lot more comics thought like you. Um, I've had a, an amazing time, not, not only just talking to you today, but like learning about who you are and what you're like Mm -hmm. as a performer and you know uh, and i now class you as one of my favorite canadian comics like you know you're appreciate that you're dope so i hope everyone goes out and uh and and goes to the show you said the rec room yeah there's the rec room yep and if you need a ticket link you can go to rank the letter n vile.com and through tour dates there's a link right there to go to eventbrite awesome darren frost frosty thank you so much man i appreciate you i appreciate it no problem we'll see you soon cheers um yeah i meant what i said uh, there is a, there is a, I'm just drawn to comedian culture. I'm drawn to like their personalities and who they are. And I think when you have a guy that's been working in the industry for 30 years, like Darren Frost, uh, it is, it is a compelling thing to see someone fight back against forces that are trying to water down the quality of the content within their industry. So a uh, big thank you to Darren Frost tomorrow. Uh, we have friend of the show, Karima Sad coming on to talk about the incident that had taken place the other day where her and her cameraman were assaulted by um, Beaver Cleaver with uh, 
with an attitude problem. This guy, like, I don't usually make fun of little people because I'm like five foot six, but if that's what we look like, us short dudes, when we try to like be tough, eh, we should probably stop doing that. Or just do what I would do: just grab grab something like a broken bottle and just jump on them and stab in the neck. You know, it's a, it's a good way to go about it. No, but for real, um, Karima should not be subjected to any of that shit. It always makes me upset. It makes me feel like I'm about 7,000% Italian. But because she's Karima, the wise oracle, um, I, I, I posted something on Twitter where it was like, don't worry, uh, Karima, I'll take care of it. And it was just a picture of De Niro or a gif of De Niro and Goodfellas. And then I saw her on the Dean Blundell show and she was like, well, obviously I'm not going to you know, encourage anybody to use violence in this situation because that's not how I am. So... I'm always being taught lessons by this wonderful, wonderful lawyer, advocate, and friend. And so Kareem and I will be on tomorrow. I haven't decided if I'm doing a show on Friday, but if I do, go check it out. And uh, I hope you guys caught the episode earlier today when I had, I, so this is my second episode today. I did one at 11, um, DJ Kenny Parker of uh, Boogie Down Productions. So, and he told me that him and Karis one because they're brothers, are going to come on the show if I just let them argue about hip hop for an hour. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. So that's that. We'll see Karima tomorrow. Thank you again to Darren Frost. And until next time, have a good one. Black black, 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 black,